Hello and welcome to The Agenda. I'm Stephen Cole. With global interest rates at record lows and pandemic volatility just about everywhere you look, this week we'll be considering where we should be investing if we want to make some money. Should we still be looking at stocks and shares? And if so, which sectors should we be focusing on? Have Reddit and GameStop changed the very nature of investment? We'll get the views of an expert. And will bricks and mortar still be a safe bet in a post-pandemic world? COVID-19 has had an impact on structural weaknesses in economies around the world. Here in Europe, interest rates are at almost 0%, so many are searching for investments with the promise of better returns. The Bank of England estimates that British savers squirrelled away £100 billion. That's about $140 billion during COVID-19 lockdowns. But many could be losing out from below par deals. So just where should people be looking for an above inflation return on their money? Pension funds, stocks and shares are the obvious places to start. And while some markets around the world fell as much as 34% on the confirmation of the pandemic in March 2020, the markets bounced back and ended the year on average 62% higher. But not all of them. Spain's IBEX fell by more than 18% in 2020, and the FTSE in London has had its worst year since 2008, falling almost 13%. Some companies have benefited from lockdowns. Video calling companies like Zoom and unicorn meal kit delivery company Gusto have seen huge surges in demand. During economic recession or political turmoil, many would-be investors turn to commodities, as the price of tangible assets tends to move in the opposite direction from stocks and bonds. Gold is often seen as a safe haven, but this year it's been outperformed by its metal cousin, silver. In February, silver reached an eight-year high, driven largely by traders on the discussion forum Reddit, looking to circumvent the world's huge hedge funds. The same tactic recently sent shares in US video retail chain GameStop soaring. Property prices around the world too held up and even rose throughout 2020, especially those with outside space and a place for a home office. And even some of the perhaps trickier investments, like wine or art, are still worth a look. Many have been worried that collectors would be somewhat timid in the time of pandemic, but the sale of a portrait by Botticelli in January this year for $92 million seems to have proved the doubters wrong. But we always need to remember that investments can go down as well as up, and there's no guarantee you'll ever be as fortunate as those who, in 1997, invested $1,000 in Amazon when it floated. Well, today, that $1,000 would be worth $1.43 million. Here with me now to take a closer look at the investment landscape going forward is Moira O'Neill, investing columnist and head of personal finance at Interactive Investor. Moira, do you have any firm and fixed rules for investing? Well... There's no really safe things that you can do with your money. If you kept it in, in the bank, then you might be at risk of losing out to inflation. Um, uh, investing is the surefire way to, to grow your money, um, particularly if you can put it away over the long term. Now, I say that with a lot of caveats. There's always the risk you can lose, lose money, whatever you do with your money. But if you can put it aside for five, preferably 10 years, then that lowers the risks. And um, if you can spread your investments around among a lot of different types of assets or geographies or sectors, then that will also lower your risk. The key is to have your plan, stick to it. You can even invest regularly, so say monthly, rather than putting us in big lump sums. And that will make sure that you uh, benefit from, from the ups and downs in the markets as well. You hinted about putting your money in the bank, uh, but getting almost zero interest rates, and so not getting any money back. In fact, losing money, because with inflation, you would lose money in the long run. Is it, with interest rates so low, becoming increasingly hard to get value for investments or find a place to make money? 
I think there's always opportunities. Um, and, and the key is to not get so fixated on making money very quickly. Um, I think we've seen a lot of people get excited about that over the, the past year in particular, because there's been so much volatility in the market. But really, you want to have a solid, dependable plan whereby you, you benefit from, from long-term growth, and you also uh, benefit from things like reinvesting the dividends from your investments. And also, you benefit from um, spreading your money around. So some investments will rise and some will fall at different times in the market. But overall, the general trend will be upwards. So what sectors should people be looking at in the, uh, possibly a post-COVID world? COVID has changed our world. I mean, people are now looking towards new technologies, new ways of living. Um, cloud computing has become a, a, big, a big sector. Certain sectors that did look good before, such as um, commercial property investing, isn't quite looking as good now. Um, and I think we can all look around us and see how our behaviours have changed. Um, you know, we're all using zoom etc or equivalents to um to communicate with family friends work colleagues and we're all um consuming more um tv more netflix type packages um so we can we can look at what we're uh, uh, having things delivered, delivered to our homes more as well ethical investing has been quite a big trend uh, in the last few years do you see that likely to continue Absolutely. Um, I mean, ethical investing is something that has really come into the mainstream now. We see investors of all ages um, um, showing an interest in ethical investing. So that's putting your values um, alongside your, your money. And, uh, and, and it can mean different things to different people. Um, but we see a lot of fund management groups um, launching new products bringing um, something called ESG, which stands for environmental, social and governance issues into their, uh, their investment processes. And I've seen some predictions that within five years, every investment fund you can think of is going to have some element of ethical type investing within its process. Another COVID effect. A lot of people have spent a lot more time at home as you said, either watching television or on their laptops uh, and phones. So does that mean we, we are sort of in the midst of uh, a rush of um, amateur, younger investors, people who wouldn't normally seek to invest? And I'm thinking, of course, of the big story recently about GameStop. Uh, well, I think we have seen a lot of um, amateurs come into the market. Um, and the key there is that are they... Are they really investing or are they gambling? And there is a fine line between that. If you come in as an investor thinking, I'm here to make money very quickly from this one opportunity that I've spotted and you're jumping on a bandwagon and you're maybe doing it because one of your mates suggested it, then you are, are possibly on the verge of the gambling side. If you've come into investing thinking, I'm going to create a solid plan. I'm going to drip feed my money in. I'm in it for the long term and I'm going to make sensible investments and I'm not going to dip in and out so quickly. And there's nothing wrong with trading, um, but, but if you, you really think you, you can always make a quick buck, you're, you're, you're going to be badly burnt at some point. So I think you need to have that solid plan and make sure you keep to a, a decent investing strategy. And I take that as telling us to maybe treat GameStop-type dealing and investing with a degree of caution. Absolutely. You have to be cautious around these things. I mean, they're fascinating to read about. And they're always going to be people who make money, but they're always going to be those who get badly burnt when the party ends. Maura O'Neill, thank you so much for joining us here on The Agenda. Of course, one of the biggest if not the biggest investment story of 2021, has been the extraordinary tale of GameStop, the American video games retailer, and how its shares shot up 
thanks to posters on the online forum Reddit. Well, here with me to explain just what happened and what it could mean for investors going forward is Arturo Briss, Professor of Finance at the International Institute for Management Development in Geneva. Um, Arturo, for the amateur investor, can you explain to all of us the fuss over the share trading frenzy over GameStop and Reddit? What has happened with the GameStop is that for the first time in our financial market, we have had coordination of small investors that get together through technology in order to push stock prices up. And this is new because by so doing, they have hurt, have hurt it a lot institutional investors and particularly hedge funds. So that's, for me, what is shocking about this event, not so much that there are source sellers, but the fact that through information sharing and through network, through Reddit, investors, they collude in order to push prices up. It was described as a sort of David and Goliath story, wasn't it? Is, is that accurate? Exactly. You see, what happened normally in financial markets is you have these big players, the Black Rocks and the Fidelities and the pension funds and the mutual funds that dominate trade, and they, they, they drive prices. Whenever one of these institutional investors makes a big trade, stock prices go up. And so far, that was fine, and that was acceptable. For the first time in the GameStop episode, individual retail investors had the same market power. And that, of course, I think they shake the foundations of financial markets, and that's why uh, institutional investors and regulators went after the platform, Reddit, and after uh, Robinhood, the internet uh, um, broker that was facilitating the trades. Um, it, this was a big financial story for 48 hours, maybe three days, but are there any longer-term repercussions you can see in it? I think what, the, what this episode shows is that technology creates a new financial system in which through information sharing and by allowing individuals to coordinate, then we're giving market power and then power at the end of the day to individual, possibly uninformed investors, which is to me a new order. Because as I said so far, financial markets were oligopolies in which retail investors had no impact whatsoever on trades, uh, sorry, on prices. Now this changes. So technology changing the way trades are made. So uh, th this means the big beasts of Wall Street, uh, were they humbled? Which, of course, the whole world would like to see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, As, and that, that's why you have seen this fierce reaction. Not so much because at the end of the day you had a bunch of short sellers who suffered massive losses. It is because now we are confronted with a new situation in which prices are truly predictable. That is, you cannot control them because they depend on a very, very volatile uh, sentiment. And in particular, but it depends on the force of individuals and, as I said, uninformed investors. Is this something, Arturo, for the average investor, the, the sort of informed amateur? Yes, I think that the danger of all of this at the same time is that we go to market without knowing what we're exposed to. And in GameStop, we have seen source sellers, security lenders, hedge funds, individual investors, pension funds, all together. And that's very complicated. I think it's very important for individuals, um, you know, small investors, that when they enter the markets, they need to understand the, rule of, the rules of markets. And, and, and they probably it, don't, because those markets are so dominated by the big hedge funds, aren't they? Yes, exactly. And, and, and the hedge funds and the, the other institutional investors, they know the rules. To me, the worry is that we think that financial markets, they are simple because we can have access to an online trader where we can put our money and then we can buy stocks. And they say, wow, this is great. There is much more to it. And if there's anything that we need to learn from this episode, is that there is need for more financial education. And Robin Hood, GameStop, Reddit, are we seeing the rules or the future of investing change because of what happened during those 48 hours? Yes, I think with financial market, we have seen the same disruption as in many other industries, in which the ecosystem enlarges. And now we have players, particularly technology players, that are a very important part of financial markets as well. Online brokers, uh, social networks and social platforms, they are not as undesirable 
as we could think, because they bring more information to markets and they make them more efficient. But of course, they would probably need different rules because the rules that apply to the traditional financial institution cannot apply to a new financial institution called Reddit or called Robinhood. Arturo Briss, many thanks to you for joining us here on the agenda. Thank you. Still to come here on the agenda, alternative investments. We'll be considering the returns on splashing your cash on wine. Murray, what would you say is a good question? Stephen, I'd say it's one where there's always more than one answer. The Answers Project is a new podcast series from CGTN Europe. With me, Stephen Cole. And me, Mari Beveridge. In each episode, we'll take a complex question. And with the help of some of the world's foremost experts, shine light on some of the answers. So join us for The Answers Project. Available wherever you get your podcasts. And welcome back to The Agenda. Property has always been a key space for investors. In spite of the pandemic, here in the UK, for example, property prices actually rose by more than 5% in 2020. So will it continue to be a safe haven for investors this year? Here with me now is the CEO of Capital Rise, a company which provides funding for property developers, Uma Raja. Uma, what does Capital Rise offer investors? So we are a specialist lender, as I mentioned. So we lend money to property developers, as you explained, in very specific parts of the UK market. What we then do is we allow various different types of investors to invest in those loans. And they range from um, banks and financial institutions to individuals who can invest on our online platform. They have to be uh, high net worth or sophisticated investors, but they can then invest in those loans. Um, the loans are secured uh, against an underlying property which means that this, you have an additional level of, uh, I guess, security in as much as if the borrower is unable to repay the loan, we have a first legal charge typically over the asset, which means we could force the sale of the asset in order to get all of our investors repaid. Now, we've never had to enforce some security on a loan as all of our loans have performed, but it's good to know that you have that security to do that. Um, and to date, we've lent nearly £100 million out to property developers. Of that, we've repaid back to our investors over 34 million uh, with an average rate of return of 9.5% per annum. Has the pandemic, do you think, changed what people are looking for in a residential investment? Absolutely, yes. So I mean, one of the benefits of our part of the market is that we've seen, you know, the market has been stimulated throughout, you know, by, by the pandemic. Uh, and that's because, you know, we've all been locked in our houses for unprecedented amounts of time. Uh, and that's made people reflect very much on, are they happy with their surroundings? Do they want to move? Do they want to buy an additional property? Do they maybe want to get an additional property out in the country with a bit more space? Do they want a home office? Do they think maybe that, you know, remote working is going to be a permanent part of their lifestyle moving forward? Therefore, you know, what changes might they want to make? And, and that hasn't necessarily been you know, a general trend people talk about is people moving out to the country. And for sure, we've seen that prime home counties market stimulated throughout the, the you know, last year and see that continuing this year. Um, but also it hasn't been at the expense of prime central London. Again, I was reading an industry report over the weekend uh, talking about how prime central London transactions were up by 24% Q4 last year versus Q3. Uh, and again, you know, people still wanting to kind of stay in the same areas, but maybe buy a different type of property and more outdoor space or more space, et cetera. Um, so, yes, we've definitely seen a lot of trends being stimulated as a result of people being locked in their homes and, and anticipating remote working being a, a, an ongoing part of their lifestyle to some extent. High-end uh, real estate is historically um, inaccessible to everyone. So how does what you offer help a broader range of uh, investors? Exactly right. So that's one of the reasons why we built the business in the first place. So the type of um, investment product that we offer has historically only been accessible to institutions and ultra high net worths because the minimum entry size, is, you know, ticket size is in the millions. Um, so that sort of really cut out a vast range of investors that could access these sorts of investment opportunities. But by building a digital platform, we now can enable you know, a much broader range of investors. Our minimum investment size is £1,000 um, to access what is a very unique 
um, you know, asset class, as you say, very inaccessible historically. The pandemic has, has damaged a lot of businesses and very many business models uh, have been destroyed because of the pandemic. But you seem very optimistic and very positive about the property market. Is, are your expectations as positive for 2021? Absolutely. I mean, we, uh, as a business, we grew significantly last year. Um, just to give you an example, you know, last year, we screened over five and a half billion pounds worth of applications for finance. That was up from 3.4 billion the year before. So just to give you an example of the, uh, you know, the depth of the need for, for finance in our part of the market, it's, it's quite substantial. Um, and we see that continuing. I mean, the market forecasts for this year are continued growth. And um, if you look at um, what happened in 2020, um, again, I was reading a report over the weekend, you know, prime London prices are, are back now to the level they were at the start of 2020. It's an incredibly resilient part of the market. It's shown that you know, in the last 12 years, and, we, and now it's forecast for growth. Omar Raja, many thanks for joining us on the agenda. Thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure. Stocks, shares, bonds and property are all pretty traditional areas for global investors, but there are other growing opportunities which can offer the chance to make some real money. One such is wine. And here to explain more is Dominic Brennan. Uh, Dom is a director at finewineinvestment.com, part of the Noble Rot Group. Um, Dominic, wine is wonderful to drink, um, but why would people want to invest in it? And what exactly are they investing in? Hi, Stephen. Um, well, fine wine is a, a physical asset, first and foremost. So it's uh, a hedge against inflation. It's a store of value. And in uncertain times that like we've seen in 2020 with this horrible pandemic, um, it sort of um, helps to secure against market volatility. I mean, it's also capital, uh, capital gains tax-free. Um, the underlying indices, the, the market, which we call the LiveX 100, has risen substantially over the last 20 years. So it's a, an asset group that I think deserves a lot more attention. But is it a gamble? For example, buying en primeur. And for people who don't know, en primeur is uh, buying wine before it's bottled and released on the market. Is that the way to make money? A bit of both. So um, sometimes you'll go into the secondary market and buy wines which have been in circulation for a couple of years. A, a, a portion of what we do is en primeur, where you buy wine, as you say, in barrel. Um, that has um, historically been a good way of investing in wine. You would traditionally, as you would know, probably buy two cases and the value, the growth of, of both cases would mean you could sell one and that would pay for you and enable you, enable you to drink the second. Um, the thing about en primeur is that the gains for the, for the buyer have, uh, have reduced over the last five years, certainly over the last 10 years. Um, but what the pandemic did was meant that with all these stocks in Bordeaux of the 2019 vintage, which was the, which was the most recent, um, the Bordelais thought, well, people's, people haven't got that much cash this year. They reduced um, the, the prices of their wines, which meant they actually got a really great vintage at a, at a far re reduced cost. Um, so for investors, that particular campaign, most recently 2019 in Bordeaux, was a boon. Does it follow, Don, that a, a good wine to drink would also sell well on the secondary market? There are caveats, but generally, yes. I mean, what we tend to do in Oberot is look at the, the very best wines, critically acclaimed wines, from the best years, from the best producers. Um, whether it's vintage champagne or it's Bordeaux or it's Burgundy, um, there's an inherent um, quality with some of the best wines, and um, that's where the market follows. So how would you go about creating an investment portfolio in wine? Well, you find, find a fine wine broker, and what they should be able to do is put together a, a portfolio that's, that's diverse, most importantly, not just Bordeaux, but perhaps wines, vintage champagne, or wines from the Rhone, or Burgundy, or American wines, perhaps. Um, but you're looking for a portfolio that is robust. So it's diverse, but it's robust. Um, and then it's over over to the broker to put that together for you. I mean, you, you never see your wines. Um, you can go and visit them in a bonded warehouse. Um, but they're the, one of the big things about fine wine investment is that the, the wines remain uh, remain in bond. Um, that means you don't pay UK government's duty or VAT on the wine. That's a big part of it. Um, white fine wine is also, yeah, as I said before, capital gains tax free, which is a quite a big um, plus point for investors. It's, it's classed as a wasting chattel, like a like a racehorse. Are there particular wines that are uh, sought after by investors? Yes, there are. There are. I mean, the, the first gross of Bordeaux, wines like, you know, Chateau Lafitte Rothschild, which is particularly um, popular in China and in the Far East, 
um, wines, other, other first growths like Aubryon and Mouton Rothschild. But more recently, wines, champagnes are, are particular, particular favourites, things like Salon, Krug, uh, Moët Chandon, Cristal, uh, and some of the top burgundies as well. So there is, there is certainly a pyramid where the top wines are more sought after. And, and this, there's something called um, inverse supply, which drives fine wine. Essentially, as, as anyone knows, you know, each producer only makes a certain number of bottles every year of each wine. And over time, as you drink those bottles and they're broken or damaged, um, there's only a finite amount of supply of that, of that wine left that diminishes. And of course, over time, um, wine is one of the few assets that improves with age. Of course, what every investor is looking for is value, is looking to make more money. And I can see in the past 30-odd years, the wine market has changed enormously. The market, I estimate, hit the buffers about a decade ago. But what kind of returns are you looking at in 2021? Um, what, what kind of, and what kind of time scale should you allow for getting a return on your money? I would say that fine wine is, is certainly a medium to long-term investment. So it's not something you would you flip and, and, and return in, in, say, half a year or a year. Um, that being said, I mean, it would be, we would expect single, strong single-digit returns on an annualised basis. Um, but, you know, higher-risk, shorter-term strategies um, tend to yield, you know, results per annum of in the 20s to 30s. So it really does, um, might sound like a bit of a cop-out of an ounce, but it does depend hugely on what the makeup of your portfolio is. But certainly, you know, for example, over the last, I think, um, the fine wine index has grown by 10.9% over the last 19 years. You know, the fine, the, the vintage champagne index, the sub-index of, of the market, has um, risen by about 9% per annum over the last 16 years. So there's strong and, and more importantly, consistent growth. Um, fine wine is less volatile than, than other markets. Ultimately, wine is a, is a, is a, is a beautiful art form. Um, and so it's nice to be able to sink some of those profits back into drinking the stuff you, you invest in, which is quite nice. Dominic Brennan, the director at Noble Rot, many thanks for joining us on the agenda. Pleasure. Thank you, Stephen. With interest rates across Europe at historic lows, anyone fortunate enough to have a few euros or pounds to spare is looking for extra value for their money. Some smaller investors have gambled on the stock market, knowing at the same time that shares can go down as well as up. But there are other, perhaps less well-known investment opportunities. Property, classic cars, even wine. As we heard from Dominic Brennan, wine is a tax-free environment and a fun alternative to shares and bonds. And, of course, you can always drink the profits. Burgundy and Bordeaux are popular with Chinese investors because the wine market is dynamic and wines are improving every year. Another home for your money could be art. In the past decade, the value of American art has risen nine times faster than the US stock market. The artist, uh, Andy Warhol, once said, money is art. And he was right, and death has done little to diminish his value. His work has sold for a cumulative three and a quarter billion dollars at auction in the past 10 years. But the best advice to the small investor seems to be to have a clear, simple and balanced strategy. Not everyone can manage this. Indeed, rebalancing is effective because it works against the boom-bust cycle. It's well worth taking the time to think about what you really want from your investments and not just trying to jump on the latest investment bandwagon you may have come across on social media forums. Knowing yourself, your needs and goals and your appetite for risk is a good start. Different weights will lead to different paths of returns. But what really matters is not the nature of an investment rule, it is whether or not you can stick to it. So keep it simple. Don't forget you can watch everything from past Agenda episodes and find additional exclusive content on our website, cgtn.com slash Europe or on our YouTube channel. And of course, you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, at CGTN Europe. Coming up on a future agenda, the battle of big tech. We'll be considering what the future holds for the likes of Google, Apple and Facebook. But for now, from me, Stephen Cole, and all the Agenda team here in London, it's goodbye. <laughs>